Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, having me. Um, actually, I'm, my name is Paul. I'm from Jakarta. I, um, I'm, I work in Zenius Education, which is an ag tech company from Indonesia. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I came to this meetup. I think this is my third time. Uh, and well, happens to be a speaker. And um, I just knew, I, I know a few faces around, but uh, yeah, it is new experience. And uh, when Melinda asked me to, to share uh, my experience or our experience as a company using Clojure, uh, expecting that probably I can share a little bit of, uh, you know, using the library of this or that library. But uh, we're not really expert in one sort of library or, or that library, but probably we want to share uh, the use of closure in, in this educational space, a tech space, and uh, our experience in, probably not experience, well, but uh, how, you know, get, you know, closure into production. And yeah, I think that's the thing. And yeah, so um, that's my, my topic, closure or closure script in educational technology. And our mission as a company, we're, we're there to promote science and reason with the help of 21st century alien technology. We, uh, if you're not familiar with alien technology, I mean, the, the way, uh, the, why we chose closure is because me and my uh, colleague, the CTO, we're both, we were both a common lisper. Uh, any, anyone f familiar with common lisper? Anyone ever code? It? Okay, good one common lisper. <laughs> so yeah, uh, my background, personal background, I, I was uh, a study, I was studying in uh, artificial intelligence uh, background. And uh, naturally at that time, we're using <laughs> common list. And as, uh, that's what happened to my CTO too. But then uh, I founded the company in 2004, actually, and I stopped, totally stopped programming uh, and just started programming uh, in 2010, I think 2013, when my CTO introduced me to Clojure. <laughs> okay, so that's, uh, we see Clojure as the Lisp for the 21st century, Lisp, uh, so it's more than Lisp. All right, so. Okay, so, okay, this is just an introduction for a company. And yeah, we're, our goal is to promote science and reasons in, you know, Indonesia with a country with large population, but a bit, you know, uh, lack of critical thinking and all. So yeah, that's, uh, that's quite difficult. That's quite a challenge. And, and in education, uh, you know, ranking, in terms of education, Singapore always ranked at the top of the PISA test. This, this is, there's this OECD ranking, like 80 countries tested on math, uh, reading, math, reading, and science. Uh, I think uh, they, they tested the 10th grader uh, for math, science, and reading, and Singapore always ranked at the top for all categories. Vietnam somehow uh, ranked in the top quarter. That's kind of, uh, anomaly for for uh, an ASEAN and the other Asian countries, we're you know basically a bottom dweller. Yeah. So <coughs> so the challenge is how to provide quality education in Indonesia at first, uh, but then well, we're moving to uh, also planning to expand to into Vietnam and Philippines. And yeah, so naturally um, there are some problems, low speed internet connection. Uh, in rural areas especially and in the cities somehow we have uh, unstable or poor signal or internet connections in the schools I don't probably the, the you know the architecture of the school or something makes it you know very poor signal or something so it's yeah it's a bit of challenge and uh, okay a little background with the Zenius it was founded, incorporated actually, incorporated in 2007. Uh, we started operation in 2004. Uh, right now we have like 100 plus employees. And 
our main site, this is the Zenius.net, launched in 2010. Uh, yeah, built using PHP, so we, yeah, uh, we made that uh, foolish mistake, I think so. And now, in Zenius.net, we have, uh, I think, okay, yeah, 66,000 videos there, built in-house videos. Uh, right now, uh, last year actually, we have almost 8 million unique visitors and 80 million videos played. And yeah, uh, it's still, you know, uh, the main site is still built on uh, PHP and we're shifting towards closure uh, parts by parts. Uh, the migration process, I, I think it's been uh, for the last two years. And yeah, hopefully we'll be done in, in one year and uh, one more year. <coughs> yeah, this is the traffic growth of the uh, of the site. So uh, yeah, I think we, we need to make it faster uh, because yeah, video video streaming some those sort of things is a little bit problems in background. Okay, so uh, we have two developers team developer teams in total. 10 to 16, uh, depending on how we, you define uh, 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 developers. And the first team, yeah, the, the main job of the first team is mostly uh, migrating from the old site, uh, the old uh, PHP into Clojure. That's a lot of work. Uh, and we kind of underestimate, <laughs> actually, the, the, amount, the amount of work uh, requires to do so. So yeah, this in, in progress. But then we are in the process of building uh, the second product. Uh, the second product, uh, that's this uh, new development team. And I personally in charge for uh, this uh, new product. So I'm going, I'm going to talk about this new, uh, uh, new product. Because the, f the, first, uh, the, the main site, uh, that's not really my thing. So I will share our, uh, my experience uh, in building this new product. Okay, oh yeah, see, we, we're, we're moving to Clojure since 2013. Um, okay, so why Clojure? Because it's less and uh, it's, it runs on GVM. That's the first thing that uh, when, when my CTO told me that, okay, why, why you choose, choose sleep? We have you know, alternatives at that time, probably uh, Python or or uh, Scala's, but he basically said, okay, this is, this is Lips. This is Lips running on GVM, so, okay. Enterprise level, that's good. And um, run on browser too. At that time, Clojure script is, was not really a thing, but somehow, okay, you can run uh, compile to JavaScript, that's a good one, uh, and then on Node, so we can do scripting uses, using Clojure script too. And I never tried personally, but since, you know, uh, are you guys familiar with React Native? Uh, React Native, so yeah, uh, it it's, it's also runs on uh, mobile OS using this React Native. Oh, by the way, uh, I make an assumption that uh, this meetup will be consisting of uh, probably uh, people in Clojure that has experience of, let's say, two years or something. Uh, to check my whether my assumptions correct, uh, how many are you uh, having? You know, at least two years experience in enclosure. Okay. Well. Okay. So, and how many of you uh, less than six months? Okay. Right. So, a bit. Yeah. But okay. Hopefully, no problem. <laughs> so yeah, that's the first reason. Yeah. Uh, list being a list is really a big thing for us because <coughs> uh, second part is because code can be treated as data. This is uh, you, as you will see uh, in the next uh, uh, in the next slides probably. Code can be treated as data. This is really important for us because uh, the nature of our uh, the nature of our system. Uh, we want. We, we want the uh, the applications to you know to the runs, whereas uh, we can add more uh, code into the application in, uh, in life, uh, you know, running life. <coughs> okay, and 
somehow, okay, this is a, big, a bit out of topics. As a teacher, I'm also a teacher. As a teacher, I teach programming to, to high school kids, as well as the college. Uh, uh, and most of our students, when learning programming, they learn programming as the, f you know, they, they, they are first programming. Uh, I mean, these are my courses, mostly, as the, you know, the, the first programming course they take. So, I've tried several different languages to teach these kids programming. Uh, but the programming part that I teach is not like application building, but mostly into, to, to solve mathematical, mathematical problems or physics problems, basically to help them you know, uh, grasp uh, their, their own uh, courses in, in, school, uh, in schools, but uh, using more you know, automated process. And somehow, compared to Python, uh, closure is better in uh, being being grasped by the first first timer. That's that's actually uh, well, it's actually surprising because we 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 we, <coughs> we tend to think that Python is pr probably the, the the basic language or the easiest one or something like that. But somehow the students is uh, those who are not exposed to the procedural algorithmic kind of programming somehow. Uh, they, they see uh, functional programming as uh, straightforward. You ask for this, you, you ask for this input, and you know, the, the output is it's not like uh, procedurally or step-by-step -step doing step-by-step -step manipulation to the data, but it's transforming this data into another form of data. That's uh, somehow natural to, that's, that's what I see at least in my students. It's natural to the, the, way, they, uh, the way they're thinking. Uh, but although Haskell tends to be much easier for them, <laughs> Haskell uh, it, uh, because Haskell is uh, very straightforward and the, the notation uh, similar to the mathematical notation, so it's easier when uh, you use uh, when they use Haskell to solve physics or math problem. But when it you know comes to a bit more complex, <laughs> Haskell is going to be very very difficult. So yeah, the dynamic part of closure actually wins in that part. And why why is it why this is important for us? Because uh, yeah, for yeah, the next slides we will talk about both of these things and why that is important. And <coughs> yeah, of course, great community. Somehow, the community works. I mean, uh, really helpful. I see a lot of experts there and the the growth of the the libraries, the environments, these. Uh, the IDE I'm using. Uh, personally, I used uh, uh, IntelliJ using Cursive uh, as a plugin. But there's this. If you, uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with Nightcode. Nightcode is a beginners friendly uh, IDE for uh, ba basically IDE for uh, uh, beginners uh, enclosure. So yeah, the the tools and everything's been great. People are very very helpful. And for us as a company, I think it's a vision of software development that we that we actually we buy into this. It's not only about tools, right? I mean, it's about the vision uh, and what kind of constraint uh, the community put into the, the the way the direction of this software development. And that is somehow a big big thing for us. And yeah, <coughs> that's. Uh, I think some 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 other companies have a different reason for adopting closure, but mainly for us, or at least for my project, my current project, these are the main reasons. So, what are the challenges? What are the project? Uh, the government, uh, Indonesian government, enforces computer-based tests for the national exam. This is a huge challenge because there are seventy-six thousand schools that need to use this in like. Every part of uh, if Indonesia is very large with 13,000 islands or more, and yeah, they, they want to uh, to do it in all the schools at the middle school level and higher school levels. There are 76,000 of them, and 
uh, I think the, the project, uh, not the project, the, the, the government enforced them to use 100% of the school to, be, to, to use the computer-based test application in 2019. Uh, well, still, you know, a long way to go. Actually, only I think it's only 35% of the schools currently using that. So, uh, yeah. And somehow, the the problem creation and scoring the tests are a tedious process for the teachers. Um, imagine one teacher in Indonesia probably needs to uh, to teach around four, three to four classes. That means. 150 to 200 uh, students uh, at, at, at this uh, particular academic year. So scoring tests, uh, creating problems and questions, that's, that would be a uh, tedious and time consuming, not tedious, uh, time consuming problems for, for these uh, teachers. And yeah, naturally students cheating during the test because it's on paper, it's, it's easily, you know, the system is, uh, the, 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 not the system, somehow the, the classroom and the, the way the sit, sitting arrangement and something, that's very easy if you do these things, if they do these things on paper. So, yeah, and then uh, sometimes teacher, uh, teachers complaining because there's this, uh, some question and ask websites like Quora type, uh, Quora type websites to for to to ask problems, to ask you know uh, asking help for uh, homework, and somehow the students can actually get the exact same problems, and they just okay just copy all the whole answer and there. That's homework cheating is always yeah big big problem and uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, this is uh, 76,000 school, schools actually in different settings, different area, some with good internet connections, and many of them are not really, really, uh, well, in fact, some of the schools that do not have a, you know, a stable power uh, supply. So yeah, this is the condition. Okay, so, uh, the solution is to create a problem bank application, problem generator, which is an exam builder app application. So basically, we create uh, problem templates. Yeah, problem templates for mathematics, physics, chemistry, and some other subjects that are tested, tested by the government. And so each of the problems will, uh, each of the problem template could generate probably hundreds of th or thousands of uh, similar problems. Uh, similar problems, but with different, let's say, for different numbers, different numbers, different wording, some variation of, uh, let's say, for English. Uh, oh, by the way, it's not only for uh, randomly generated numerical randomness, or but uh, we can use it for, let's say, English test, uh, to, uh, random generation of sentences, different, you know, different subjects, different verbs, uh, past tense or present tense, something like that. Or for chemistry, for example, yeah, well, it's, it's easy for chemistry. You have like, like this, all these um, uh, molecules or, or atoms. Uh, I'm not a chemistry teacher, so I'm not, uh, not really familiar with the detail, but uh, by combining this and you know, the, the number, uh, the atoms numbers, the mass of the, each atom, you can combine it to be a certain of kind of molecules. And, and you get this problem generation, uh, problem generator that could be you know very very versatile in generating millions of millions of problems. So, yeah, <coughs> uh, using this model, we solve at least you get a similar uh, similar kind of difficulties for each problem sets because teacher could uh, choose the problem template, not the problem per se, but the problem template. Choose this one, this one, and that one, and each of the problem template would be. Uh, having a similar uh, difficulty level. Yeah, si similar difficulty level, and it's very important to, to, to keep order in place, uh, to keep the, the problem uh, the same for uh, s uh, the same sequence for each of the student. But each problem, its instance of the problem should be unique. It can be the same uh, for each of the, uh, for let's say students. Uh, so every student will get the 
unique set of problems, but similar in difficulty level, similar in topics, and so on. Okay, basically a computer-based test application. This is uh, this is the problem generator part, the application, and this is the uh, the application to actually do the test. That's well, that's nothing nothing unique there. It's just typical test. And the other one is learning app. Uh, this is for uh, specifically for learning part and homework uh, homework uh, assignment and yeah. So. These are the, this is a test, this is the learning app, a learning application, and they use the same problem bank, but with a different set of, this is problems for tests, this is problem of the, for the homework or uh, practices, with a little bit of, you know, difference <laughs> between the prob uh, problems. Have. Okay, so that's the solution. Uh, this is the stack. Uh, I think uh, for the mo f mo for the most part, it's a typical closure stack for a web for a web-based application. Uh, we're using pedestal. Uh, are you guys using any ped pedestal here? No. Uh, how about composure? Okay, composure. So, <laughs> so yeah, we chose uh, pedestal over composure because I think it's more explicit. Uh, instead of uh, in, in composure, lots of I think a lot of magic being happens there that we don't really understand. So uh, pedestal for us is more explicit, uh, and obviously the database. What it, does pedestal do? Oh well, uh, oh sorry, uh, yeah, it's a routing uh, library for closure. So typically people do use composure, uh, but yeah, you have other alternatives, which is pedestal actually, actually uh, built. You know, developed uh, by by Cognitech, right? but yeah. So that's the routing uh, application, and I think for the server we use JT, JT or uh, Immute, and I think both. And yeah, Shelmer. But uh, are you guys familiar with Shelmer? Shelmer normally used for uh, templating. It's it's uh, it's more. It looks like a Django or a mustache uh, if you're familiar with HTML injection string extrapolation, but we don't use it for HTML generate HTML generation. We use it for problem generator. So uh, yeah, so the teachers would, would create all this uh, all this uh, problems with HTML, and then uh, inject the data. Uh, the closure data into this HTML using this Selmer application. So we use it differently, basically. Uh, for the closure script, this is interesting. We use Reframe, Reagent, React Material UI, and well, well I think this is the most, uh, the most relevant one. Uh, personally, I, I, I prefer Region at that time of uh, when, when, I, when we made the decision. Uh, we prefer Region over Ohm. Uh, region is actually a wrapper around um, React, uh, React JS, which is, uh, I think, uh, well, I think cl the closure community already settled in that part. That okay, React is uh, probably the the one that's most suitable for the functional programming on the front end. So uh, there are several wrapper uh, for this React. There's OM, uh, created by David Nolan. My CTO, my CTO actually insisted on using the OM, but uh, for us, I think region is, I, I don't know, it's, it's more, uh, in OM, we, we, we see that most, most of the manipulation happens around function, but in region, it's more like a data, sector based and all, which is, I think, better. But then comes OM next, Om, uh, next, om dot next something like that, and I think well, okay, that's that's probably better. But yeah, we already chose region for that, and for the framework, the JavaScript for, uh, for the actual, you know, mostly the framework of this closure script development using region, we chose reframe. Uh, I think we we the last time I came to this meetup, uh, there was a talk about reframe. Uh, it's as if Project script framework. 
So reframe is a functional programming, uh, no, no, a reactive, functional reactive programming model. It's similar with the old Elm, uh, that's the Haskell-like language for the JavaScript. And yeah, uh, we use reframe for that because it's, I think, uh, it's not simpler, but actually easier for, for me because, uh, yeah, uh, for our team, because they're mostly familiar with this functional reactive model. And for the actual uh, UI, we use Material UI, uh, React Material UI, uh, based on <coughs> Google Material Design. Uh, so basically, it's, it's, it's for the uh, mobile application. And uh, 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 designed by you know, Google as a suggestion, I think. And yeah, that's the code script stuff. And we use a single page application version for all, all the apps. Uh, because yeah, obviously, that's that's uh, uh, the use of this, uh, all this reframe reagent and all. OK, now the interesting stuff, at least for us. This is the experience. Teaching teachers to code enclosure. So far, we have 8,000 problem templates. So OK, uh, I think there are six or eight teachers that do not have any programming experience at all that we need to train using closure to generate this kind of problems, uh, problem generator. Because uh, the problem <coughs> would be a data that, that I said before previously, that the, code, the problem generator would be uh, closure codes that generates, uh, uh, randomly generates uh, numbers or sentence or whatever that is. And we need to teach. Um, we need to uh, teach teachers for that. And surprisingly, uh, for some of them, it's only a month. Uh, uh, it, it takes them only a month to, to code enclosure. And at, at, at most, it's three months. But wait, don't, don't uh, imagine that we, we code for you know, application building. It's, it's only to use the, at least to solve I, I think 100 or 120, 100, uh, 120 uh, foreclosure. Uh, problems. Uh, you guys uh, are familiar with foreclosure? Foreclosure solving, of course. Yeah. And I think we, we, the way we do training is uh, okay, solve 100 or 200, or 120 problems of in foreclosure, as well as probably 50 problems in project oiler. Uh, project oiler, if you're familiar, it's, it's very uh, mathematical sort of things. And yeah, and surprisingly, one to three months. No programming experience at all and yeah uh, that's that's what we do and that's that's one fun part and probably there will be more teachers uh, in the next batch 20 to 30 in January or February uh, and uh, apart from the teachers we also teach uh, the you know the interns uh, some of the interns uh, coming from our ex students actually so yeah uh, okay, so treating problem template as data. So each of the teacher creating a closure function, basically, an anonymous function, producing, uh, randomly producing uh, map, uh, closure map with uh, several keywords, and the HTML for the actual uh, presentation of the problem. That's the, that's the presentation part, HTML, and closure function, anonymous function as the data that's supplied using a Shelmer uh, library that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, so, uh, and somehow this data, uh, the teachers pro uh, develop all these problem templates using a different, different methods and they, we, we, we put it into uh, some sort of back, uh, back, uh, no, back office, back end, uh, yeah, uh, in the admin, admin mode for the teachers. So they can add uh, uh, problems live uh, into the system, uh, you know, using a, well, uh, some sort of, what, what uh, it's not like live per se, because it would be very dangerous, right? but we have uh, some sort of uh, integration task process we're using uh, semaphore, circle CI, and so whenever uh, the uh, 
the teachers commit to GitHub, uh, the test will be run to make sure that every kind of problems they have doesn't uh, don't have uh, doesn't have any error or like typical error that we check like division by zero or something like that. Uh, yeah, and yeah, that's that's uh, treating problem template as data, and then you can supply this data into the actual uh, database of our application where our our application could generate problems every time uh, they are asking for problems. Another possible solution would be uh, generate probably hundreds of prob different problems, store it into the database, and just randomly pick like among all these uh, one, 100 problems, instance of a problems. Okay, and yeah, of course, I, I mentioned it earlier, problem set for each student, but the same set of topics and difficulty level. Uh, probably for those of you who are not in education, that's not uh, really interesting. But for us in education, that's that's super cool <laughs> because you have random, not on non-unique problems, but in a similar difficulty level, the same order. Uh, yeah, and of course the datomic part. Uh, since the nature of our application is uh, the nature of the problems is uh, it's, it's basically a template. So whenever it generates a pro instance of the problem. We store it into the datomic, and we can record all this, uh, uh, all this typical database recording. But immutability of datomic somehow helps for for this. I don't know, pro probably in other area too. But for uh, in our case, uh, we can store exact answer for each student, uh, the homework, uh, exact answer at this point in time, and probably next time, and and analyze all this progress and the change in answer and whatsoever. So yeah, that's the, the other part. Okay, <laughs> this is actual code example. Uh, a typical, not a typical generator, but okay, I'll probably using the easier to, to read. This, is, this one is created by a teacher, uh, one of the teacher to, uh, to create. This is, this is uh, we, what we call the generator function as a closure function. Oh, by the way, that's, that's uh, an Emacs sort of shortcut for function fn. So yeah, they, they somehow have it that way. So what happened here is that, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, te uh, the code random, uh, randomly generated these numbers, random uh, uh, choices between one, two, three. Actually, they can use this random integer there. But somehow, yeah, you can. Uh, Please put, keep in mind that this is created by a teacher only with probably one or two months experience in closure, right? Okay, so and then uh, generating the, the answer with the condition, if this condition and that condition, oh, by the way, this is in Bahasa Indonesia. And sh shuffling the, the options, I think this is for the options. Uh, for the options of, uh, I mean, the choices of the answer. This is a multiple uh, selection. Uh, multiple choice uh, problems, and then after this one uh, goes here, the the result of this generator fun uh, the generator function is an instance of a problem, which is uh, data, which is a map, a closure map, with all this uh, key, NH3, I think probably it's nitrogen, hydrogen, something, KC, QC, Java, probably uh, it's probably the answer for the problem, and these are the alternative, uh, the choices for the, the options for the, uh, cho the choices of the problems. And that's this closure part of the problem generator. And this is the HTML part of the problem, of the problem generator. Uh, we have, yeah, uh, this, if you're not familiar with this dollar sign, there's actually a LaTeX sign, Matt Jux, uh, to to, uh, to present uh, mathematical notation, mathematical symbol, or some uh, chemical symbols into the uh, in the HTML format, and this uh, what do you call this one? Uh, the uh, bra bracket. Uh, that's that's the string injection. Uh, so if you can see here, this is a keyword. NH3, and the the, uh, the way Shelmer works, 
uh, it will inject this data into the string and you're looking for something NH3 with NH3 there. Uh, I think this is NH4, KC, and yes, there's some, there might be some there. Okay, no, okay, this one. Yeah, so the string, uh, this is the way uh, Shilmer do strings uh, uh, ex uh, injection from the data there. And this is the choice of these, the choices for the problems. True answer, so from the getting from data from the Java variable, and the false problem for different options. And yeah, basically, uh, it's actually it's uh, it's not that uh, uh, I don't know it's not that original of this idea, but somehow this does a little miracle in in our uh, in our educational operations because it's yeah it. It gives, it saves teachers, millions of teachers, a lot of uh, work, uh, <coughs> workload and all. So, and what's the roadmap for the short term? Our software actually installed in local software in school with one local software for one school. Uh, they require a Wi-Fi connection, Wi-Fi network, and probably in January, we need to be, uh, to launch the online version of the software, online server. So probably we need to solve the SEO issue to SPA. So yeah, and from local to online, we rely heavily on one JavaScript files to to be the application for since it's a single page application. Probably we need to break part, uh, breaking apart the JavaScript part. Um, and okay, this is the hardest challenge. Make the app runs on Ras Raspberry Pi or similar devices. Okay, the situation in 84% of the schools, actually they don't have Wi-Fi network. So we cannot put one server into, uh, to serve all, this, uh, all the students in the schools. So we need to uh, have one server for each class and that would be very expensive. So. Our solution, and there's another guy doing not similar thing, but uh, doing things for the teacher. They they uh, use Raspberry Pi with a router on top of it, and so they call it EduBox. So this EduBox serves 40 students without any Wi-Fi network. But they need uh, we need one server, one Raspberry Pi for each of the for each of uh, class. So probably we need to either make our application smaller, change the atomic into MySQL probably to, to, to fit into Raspberry Pi or at least uh, something uh, we call, I think Orange Pi or something that is probably bigger uh, uh, RAM. Or we could port it all together into Node.js mode. So yeah, using Node.js probably smaller than GVM. So that's one way, uh, a possible way to, to do that. And Okay, this is the short term in in few months. Ah, uh, sure, mobile app, native uh, or React Native. Has anyone tried to to use CodeScript to actually build React Native? Because this is actually I'm asking a, a, you know, uh, an honest question here because I'm considering whether to use Native or React Native because we don't want to use other language uh, other than Clojure if, if possible. Anyone using CodeScript for React Native? No, okay. So probably I'll come for the next meetup when <laughs> you guys have this one. All right, uh, mid and long term. Uh, the government requires some sort of mapping uh, of this all the schools. Uh, we have 34 provinces with 500, I think, 500 municipal uh, uh, level two uh, district in Indonesia. So we need to collect all this data and doing geographical analysis for the school performance. That means data analysis, data science, what's, or what's not, and visualization and all. So, yeah, your, your thing would be interesting <laughs> there. And, yeah, adaptive dynamic, dynamic learning using our video and problem libraries. Basically, we have 66,000 videos and probably more in the next few years. And we have problem libraries already there. 
Now we want the student, the student have different uh, uh, ability to, 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 to solve certain problems and they, they have different set of skills and here and there. So we want uh, our system to adjust to, uh, to the student's ability to solve problems. So let's say, oh, this is too, too fast for him or her, so we could uh, pro provide uh, problems that is uh, easier and take it more step by step. And basically how to extract all these libraries or these videos or these uh, articles or uh, problems and to adapt to the needs of the student. And that obviously requires some machine learning uh, which is the area that would be uh, probably in 8 to 12 months. And the tackling knowledge scale dependency, this is data-driven curriculum design. Uh, which is actually, this is one of the big, big uh, issue in uh, educational technology. Because naturally, I don't know, normally, traditionally, we design curriculum by, by uh, as a I let's say design a curriculum for physics or for mathematics or for biology or something like that. And this is the steps that we think that we think student needs to to master before. And this is the requirements. Okay, this is the topic, and this is the sequence in, in order how students should learn about each subject. That's the traditional way of of thinking. And uh, I don't know how, how how far we are into this thing, but the the way we see it is that. Uh, actually, when you solve mathematical problems, let's say, uh, oh, what a words, uh, what's worst problem in mathematics? Probably you need other uh, area of uh, other subject skills, like say, reading capabilities or reading comprehension skills. So we want to develop some sort of uh, dependency uh, amongst different subjects, different topics, different skills. So and analyze uh, from the, 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 their ability to solve certain kind of problems, whether they have solved one topic in physics, let's say, uh, whether they can uh, solve one topic in physics if they haven't do this part of math or this part of math and, and create a network of dependencies between a certain kind of knowledge. That's uh, one, one big challenge, I think. But uh, I can see that this is, uh, this is totally required in 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 our uh, educational process because uh, we can just assume that okay if you want to do physics this is the requirements blah blah blah, blah only in physics but actually sometimes they need a different kind of sets not only in physics probably in reading skills in numerical mathematical skills in uh, graphics or something like that so that's the long term plan out of this topic and okay so yeah okay uh, yeah, that's me Zeta's education and by the way we're hiring if you're interested <laughs> uh, yeah sure uh, we need experts if you're interested in full-time part-time remote basis or if you are a company doing outsources yeah we yeah obviously we need a lot of help in this department Okay, uh, any question? Yes. I have a question. Um, I'm just curious, why did you decide it's, it's better to train teachers to write closure rather than creating some tool for them that like, has a good UI, easy to use, and they can just generate their uh, problems from templates? Yeah, yeah. Because learning closure is like, uh, it's taking the long way. I'm, I'm, I'm all in favor of learning training teachers to, to use Clojure, I think that will be very beneficial, but uh, at the same time, that's more time than Yes, sure. Um, well, that's a good question. First, actually, there are several other companies doing, uh, actually, Khan Academy, if you're familiar, they're using the templates to generate the problem using, yes, just put it in. But it turns out that kind of process is tedious for the teachers. It's, you know, it's not really motivating if you put this, okay, this variable, whatever. somehow, uh, using, you know, learning new skills in closure, uh, we got several other side effects. <laughs> side effect. Say, uh, teachers who learn closure, actually they have better, uh, you know, performance in, in logical skills. And somehow debugging, uh, debugging skills increase their capability of scientific uh, 
you know, scientific method, because debugging is like, you know, in a way it's a scientific process, like it's like a research uh, testing this part and this part to find which, which error, uh, which things that, that generate error. Was your main goal to train the teachers? No, no, exactly. Uh, our main goal is obviously to, to generate more problems, right? But there are, uh, we haven't been able to create the template yet, uh, the, you know, the UI for the generator. Uh, so at first we try to use it in, in a traditional way. I mean, like okay, just just teach the teachers closure and see what happens. And so the interesting part of that is that <laughs> hey, we, we found another uh, another effect uh, impact uh, to the teachers uh, cognitively to the teachers. And and first, it it happens to be more fun for the teachers doing learning new things. Okay, it it takes it consumes probably one or two months more in the beginning, but then. Uh, after that, it's it's more fun for them, and uh, I think it's compared to the way uh, UI and you just putting this variable and whatever, and this one somehow more uh, more fun for them. And also, if you uh, the way uh, if you choose this template mode in UI, we have so many different possibilities. Let's say uh, that that one is generating chemical uh, chemicals, I don't know, molecules or something. But for probably for the English teachers, they need to, or, or Bahasa Indonesia teachers, they need to generate sentences. So it's so many different uh, types of UI need to be created instead. Okay, just just doing this in closure, and teachers have fun, and it's easier for us to. <laughs> That's. Okay. Have you thought about creating some kind of a repository for for the teachers to submit their templates and share with other teachers, something like that, some kind of a register? Uh, actually, yes, uh, we do have that in uh, a private re a repo. We actually, uh, it's been a year now, uh, the private repo for that, because uh, the, the problems development is still in-house. We, we haven't uh, shared it to the, you know, to the public yet. So, yeah, probably in the future, yes, that would be the direction to go. And some of the teachers already created uh, common libraries, sort of, to, to make things easier, uh, and this libraries can be used by other problem generators too. Yeah, well, thank you. So, are the teacher working at a company or anyone can register online to do uh, Yeah, for, at the moment, it's only for our own teachers, uh, in house teachers. In, uh, in house teachers. We are thinking about uh, making this into a more uh, public sort of thing. So uh, currently we see ourselves as a content company. So most of the things we, we created are in-house. But uh, the, in the next uh, step that we would do is when we, we want to expand it to Vietnam and Philippines, right? And uh, our, part, our, our potential partner is actually asking about uh, how can uh, what if we do this as a platform, and uh, where the teachers can, you know, from coming from all different uh, schools or different companies, that not not necessarily part of our uh, the company. That's that's one way. Uh, uh, that's one alternative way to do expansion to the other countries. But we're still considering uh, the you know the drawbacks because basically they 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 put codes into <laughs> the system so uh probably if we put it into you know in the middle or something that make sure that everything's safe yeah we can do that yeah any so why you choose selma huh? instead why, why don't you provide them some dsl like vectors maps for the teachers oh. to render uh, some, somehow because the teachers are already f uh, familiar with HTML. HTML is something that, that already, you know, uh, they, they, they write blogs, there's something like something like that. So yeah, they're familiar with HTML now. Now, okay, just the string injection part that they need you know, to do with HTML. Yeah. I have one more question. Um, so you said that you produce is videos. And at the same time, you mentioned well, some parts of Indonesia don't have even electricity, ah. uh, let alone the good connection. <laughs> so wouldn't that mean that a lot of potential, um, your yes. potential users are missing out on your content because they cannot stream 
video either fast enough or just don't have time? Yeah, uh, well, a uh, very important question actually. Uh, our video is uh, not, it's not a typical, you know, uh, full blown video, uh, high resolution or something like that. And we use, uh, at, I think, uh, until three years ago, we used six frames per second with a small size. With black background, it's more like a uh, Khan Academy type. We, we've been creating that kind of video, I think, actually since 20, 2004. Because we know exact, we knew at that time that uh, small, small size video is very, very important, and so we uh, we chose the kind of video that is, you know, using only back background, back backboard, only you know, uh, handwriting from the tutors and the, the the voice, and somehow the size it's only two megabytes per one minute, so it's very, very small only six uh, frame, uh, uh, yeah, frame per second. That, but now we move into 12 <laughs> frame per second with a, a little bit uh, yeah, higher audio uh, quality too. Somehow, uh, the video problem is, uh, the video is not really a problem because of this local server model. So we have, actually we have two, two sites. Uh, we have two products. The main sites online, the ZenusNet, that's uh, the site for uh, competitive tests, some student-centered learning, focus on student, no intervention, uh, no intervention from, from schools, mostly for national uh, you know, college entrance exam. And that one, it's, yeah, that's the one that we uh, need to be concerned about video. This one, it's for uh, the local server. Currently, it's local server only. And yeah, uh, compared to other uh, content, uh, develop content makers out there in Indonesia. Uh, our one advantage is the way we engineer the small size of the video. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, so, thank you. Anything else? Actually, I do have a question about the uh, buy server. So um, have you actually done some sort of field testing in terms of you know actually measuring its performance uh, with an actual like a uh, teaching session? Uh, which one? This? Uh, the, the rest of the file. Uh, no, no. Actually, that's the the next roadmap in there. Oh, okay. Okay. So we haven't we haven't been able to solve the problem yet. We we'll, we do like to to hear from you if you get any any suggestion. What's the best way to do this thing? Okay. Anything else? So yeah, that's a, like that's actually the way you know uh, adjustment from the teachers. It's not on. It's not that we r randomly generate sentence. It's the function can be any kind of closure function, uh, you know, written by these teachers. So the teachers would can decide, uh, say, uh, okay, this is these are the subjects, these are the verbs. Not only not not like okay, this like all this a thousand uh, type of subject. Probably only ten, twelve. Uh, different, you know, comments, you know, there is logical sentence, something like that. <laughs> well, that's a good question, though. I, I mean, for the numerical parts, we, we can, we have done all these tests, like, uh, to, to, you know, to prevent division by zero or something that not makes sense, but doesn't make sense. But for, yeah, contextual part, yeah, something like sem semantic part, that's, yeah, we haven't done any tests for that. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation.